I was in third semester of medical school when I decided to call it quits. I was not going to be a physician. So it is of particular interest to me and I'm honored and I think it is a privilege to be able to share a few of my views over the past several years as a physician and as a surgeon with all of you. I would like to thank Andrew Samuel and in particular the organizing committee of the COSIG or Canadian Ophthalmology Student Interest Group for this opportunity. I think many of you are probably at a stage of crossroads where you need to figure out what's going to happen with the rest of your life. For many of you, the initial, the initial goal was to get into med school and you're just about to finish and now you're thinking about a career in ophthalmology. So the, rather than focusing on how to get into ophthalmology, I would like to focus on some of the experiences and some of the challenges we all go through as we're deciding on the path we're going to take. So let's go back to that day. Up to third semester of medical school, my routine was pretty much every day I would get home, have a quick dinner, and then hit the books for the rest of the evening, sometimes into the early morning hours. And I guess we all go through different um, ideas, conversations with colleagues, with our, with our classmates. And on that particular week, we had had several conversations amongst ourselves about how other of our friends from high school were already progressing in their lives. Many of them already had jobs. Many were about to finish uh, some degrees and were already looking at a different stage. Whereas we were looking at a long haul in, in uh, medicine. In Mexico City, which is where I grew up, really you just go straight from high school into medical school. So I was 19 when I decided to call it quits. And so it was a very hard decision because uh, for the longest time, I always thought I was going to be a physician, but it somehow hit me at that stage. And uh, I believe it was some form of burnout. I guess we didn't talk about burnout back then. But I remember my, my dad coming home and watching me watch TV, which was something I would never do during the week in particular. And I simply told him, well, I'm done with med school. And so we kind of both decided to take a step back and he just said, well, this is November. Why don't you finish the semester? And I'll tell you, the next few weeks were pivotal in my career. And I'm happy to say now that after almost 40 years of being a physician and uh, over 30 years of or close to 30 years of uh, being an ophthalmologist or immersed in ophthalmology, I can share some of the things that have led me to this time and place. In other words, how I got here. So I decided to title this talk, how we get to where we are, or how you got here, and where are we going? And of course, nobody knows where each of us is going. I didn't know at 19 where I was going. Um, I had these views of what my life would be, and uh, I'd like to share a little bit of that path with you. So how we get to a certain place, I think, depends on five uh, factors that, that it's good to kind of revisit them. And the first one is luck. There's no question that luck, whether it's good or bad luck, has an impact. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to attribute everything we do to simply luck. Some people may be born in a particular country, in a particular household, uh, financially, emotionally, or in terms of opportunities, uh, there is luck. For example, in my particular case, uh, there was no physicians at all in my family. But I was lucky enough to have a, a good upbringing in a financially stable home in Mexico City. And I had the opportunity to study in San Antonio in Texas for two years. And as luck would have it, one of my best friends with whom I spent most of my weekends as a boarding student and then I would get a, a weekend pass. His father was a very accomplished hand surgeon. And just listening to his stories and listening to the activities in the hospital actually triggered that interest in, um, interest in surgery and in medicine. But you might say, well, that's, that's early. Like what happened? What happened after those 
uh, weeks or that kind of burnout period that you had in, uh, in, in third semester. So what happened, as luck would have it as well, we had some family physicians that were really connected to our family. And one of them introduced me to a surgeon who had trained in the United States and who literally took me under his wing. And so when I was 19, I discovered not just what was in the textbooks, but really what medicine was about. And after a few weeks of, of going behind him and shadowing him, I, I still remember the first time I went into the operating room with all the rules, the colors, the, the rituals that happen in surgery. And I fell in love with that. And I said, this is where I belong. And that's where I kind of got back on track. Now, many of you have come from other countries. Many of your parents have come from other countries and you've had different challenges. Some of you may have had a lot of influence in medicine. Some of you may not have had, but I think I think if one is to be successful, there always has to be an intrinsic challenge. And, and think about it in terms of like a good wine, a good Cabernet Sauvignon. It grows the best when it has that stress of a dry soil, of an intense climate, of an intense sunlight that kind of forces the grape to get as much as possible from the soil in order to grow. And so I think many of us can share stories where we really have to rise up to the challenge and take advantage of the opportunities. So whether you've had good luck or bad luck in family issues, emotional issues, financial issues, or physical issues, all of those things, if we focus them right, and if we convert them into opportunities, we're gonna rise to this challenge. The second aspect, I think, in order to get us to where we are, is having a great team. And so, of course, when we're young, that great team may be our peers in kindergarten or our peers in uh, junior high school, maybe a great basketball team, a baseball team. All of that kind of gives us that sense of, of belonging and accomplishment when we do a good job. And that team keeps changing. I, I see it in what you guys are doing here with COSIG. The fact that you're all trying to sort of band together and see how you can get the most um, information in terms of ophthalmology and be prepared for the future, that's a great team. In my particular case, it has also been uh, sort of some of the mentors that have coached me along all these years. The staff that I have, I work in four different facilities. So my main private office, then I work at a small hospital where I go there once a week. I work at the regional hospital as well, and we have a whole team of people. And then also at a private clinic where we perform uh, laser surgery and, uh, and refractive surgery. So all of these aspects of my practice encompass the coordination of, uh, of having a good team, but also we, we are a great, in great part, a result of having people who are committed, who are organized, and who will look out for any little details that may be a bit off. So make sure you value, you appreciate the team you have and you identify it. And make sure also that you are part of whatever team you choose to be in. So now we've talked about luck. We've talked about having a great team, but then we need a sense of direction. And that sense of direction is given by the core values. And so core values are, are kind of something nice to say. You know, so sometimes we say, uh, this is a, a value-based business, or this is, we're gonna look at our values and, and do this or do that. So to be honest with you, it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized that when I sat down and I reflected on which were my values, that I came and, and decided that there were three main ones. And I think it's a good idea. I mean, it took me a lot of time to kind of reach that uh, point, but I think it's a good idea at your stage to define which are those core values for you. Core values are really like, um, like a compass. They will allow you to focus on something at the distance, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Um, in my particular case, we've had to move as a family and myself as well. I've had to adapt to different things, different countries, different cultures, different languages. So I have defined one of my core values as adaptability. The second thing is um, integrity. There's no question that for me, 
there's not a place for lying, for being dishonest. If even with myself, if I want to move on in life and if I want to be successful. So for me, a second core value has been integrity. And we can talk about all of these values and, and, and be poetic about them, but I think nothing comes without hard work. And I think my third core value personally is hard work. Now, all of those things are good to define because they will define you in the time where you're really challenged. Let's say you're on a, on a sailboat and all of a sudden you hit high winds and all of that. If you have trained at looking at the GPS and the compass and you have trained about emergency measures, you will stay afloat and you will stay on course. And so you have to define those values ahead of time before you hit challenging times. So at the same time that I defined my personal values or identified them, because I guess I had always had them in some sense or another, but I really had not identified them. I also wanted to define my uh, professional values when it comes to my practice. And so the values that I've defined there are trust. So I want patients to feel comfortable putting themselves, putting their eyes in my hands. I want them to feel that trust. The second is service. Every patient has a bit of a different circumstance. So we need to be able to service our community in different ways. And the final one is excellence in eye care. And I would say all of these three values have come together in an increasing way during these past two years of the pandemic. We've had to provide service in different ways. We've had to implement virtual care. We've had to be able to provide excellence in eye care while dealing with the challenges of restrictions and disease. So now we've talked about luck. We've talked about having a great team. We've talked about the core values. And as I've mentioned, all of this has to be in the context of doing great work. So hard work, there's no substitute for hard work. You really have to um, encompass that, embrace that. We have to be thankful for having an opportunity to have a job, to work, to provide with, with our skills a service to other people. So there's no question, regardless of what you choose to do, if you want to be successful, you have to put in the time, you have to put in the work. Now, the final point in how we got here the final point is never forget where you came from. Okay, as we go through life, we may have different experiences, <clears throat> different opportunities. But I would say always stay humble and remember how you started, how before you put that first lens into the eye, you didn't know how to do that. Before you put that first stitch in somebody's skin or in somebody's eye, you did not know how to do that. And you've had people who have helped you along the way, learn those concepts and make you a comfortable physician, a comfortable and confident surgeon. So always remember where you've come from. The second aspect I would like to encompass is the stages of development. And, and this is a way that I kind of have used to uh, understand my professional development. And I've got another five steps there for you or another five kind of stages that I've, I've learned to interpret. So the first one is education. The second one is collaboration. Third one is dissemination. Next we have consolidation. And the final one is transcendence. So in the first one, you're still in that stage, education. It doesn't mean that these stages are going to be individual. They, they kind of overlap. Some of them become more prominent at certain times in our lives, and some of them kind of uh, are less important. But education is something we do throughout our lives. But education is right now probably your priority, whether it's in med school and then in residency as you get through. Collaboration is an important one. You have to collaborate amongst yourselves and then with peers and then with other a subspecialist or specialist in whatever area you choose to be in. Once you're finished your training, you have to disseminate your knowledge. You have to make yourself known in order to do something that's very important at that stage, which is building your practice. The next stage is something that I have to say, I have had still a little bit of a challenge in accomplishing, which is consolidating. I currently work in four different locations. 
but ideally one would like to consolidate things. And that may mean consolidating a practice. It may also mean consolidating one's interests, hobbies, activities. And as we go through life, I guess we experience different ways or different stages of, or different types of consolidating our different facets in our lives. And then we always want to leave something behind. So transcending takes different, different aspects. For you, maybe uh, a nice word or a nice caring gesture to a patient that you're examining as a medical student. As you begin your life as residents, maybe teaching a junior resident some skill or reinforcing certain concepts. And as we get through life, we look at different ways of transcending. And so that I think should always be in our minds. How can we make this world a better place? Now, Andrew Samuel also asked me to talk a little bit about leadership and some business, um, business tips. So I'll give you a couple of asks about uh, leadership. And I think we've been talking about this for the past few minutes. I believe there are some stages or some aspects of leadership which encompass four different things. And many of the things I will say are things from books I've read, from courses I have taken. And so it's not like I have these bright new ideas, but I'm just sharing some of my life experiences. I have now been uh, an ophthalmologist for 27 years, uh, a physician for close to 40 years. And all of these are sort of a com compiled concepts through the years. So the first one, we have to have self-reflection. We have to look at ourselves, at our strengths, at our weaknesses on a regular basis. We have to have a balanced approach as leaders. We have to listen to other people, listen to ideas. Um, sometimes the quietest person in the room may have really good ideas. We have to enable collaboration with these individuals as well. The next aspect is having true self-confidence, not being arrogant, but having good confidence based on what we know. At some point, you will be an expert in an area that no one else or very few people in the world know about, whether it's surgery or medicine in different aspects. And the final aspect is to have genuine humility. So be grateful for what you have, for the opportunities you've had, and all of those things together actually make a great leader. I would now like to mention just a couple of things about business tips. I know uh, I was sort of asked to give you a few business tips, but I'll just give you some very general things because obviously you're not at a stage right now where you're establishing a business or maybe you are. Uh, I know some people who started setting up businesses or did MBAs combined. And so you probably know more about that than what I'm going to say. But I would say in our practice of medicine, it is both, remember, an art and a science. It has different aspects, but there's also a business aspect to it. We, we have to have a successful part, practice in order to provide good care. You don't want a practice that's running in red numbers and then you're losing staff and you, don't, you can't afford equipment to diagnose diseases in your patients. So we have to be savvy when it comes to business. And you need to know how everything works from the ground up. You need to know how to test vision, check pressure, all of those things, all the way to do the surgery. Um, now equipment has become more and more sophisticated, but I, I always like to be present when new equipment is being in service. So at least I understand the ins and outs of the testing and how to improve on testing with our patients. Another important thing, and I talked about a balanced approach and listening to other people, is always involve accountants, lawyers, and possibly mentors. So as you go through life and you have major decisions to make, make sure you always engage and trust lawyers, accountants, and some mentors, some colleagues with whom you may want to bounce off ideas. And you know, the last thing is very simple. Just do it. Throw yourself into it. You've got skills. We never get a lot of um, business aspects in medical school, but at some point you're going to have to do it. Start with the basics, start with basic things and simply do it. So the final thing that uh, the COSIG committee wanted me to talk about was a little bit of innovation. And to be honest with you, um, when it comes to innovation, the first thing that pops to my mind is uh, invention. 
And and yeah, I think that's the thing. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't think I've ever invented anything, but there's different aspects of innovation. So for example, over the past couple of years, um, we have innovated a number of things in our practice. We have made things more efficient for our patients. We've developed consent videos, for example, so that patients would spend very little time in the office. We've established a collaborative approach with other uh, eye care professionals like optometrists and technicians so that our practice flows in a faster way, in a better way, more efficient way. And I think that's an aspect of innovation. Reacting to things like the early days of the pandemic where uh, in conjunction with the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, we developed a series of webinars in order to address some of the challenges and empower some of our members and the community at large to become more confident in dealing with some of the challenges with the pandemic, financial issues, uh, burnout issues. We've expanded that into uh, developing a podcast that is now on to season three as well. So those are all innovative activities. And each of you will have different attributes, different skills, and different likes and dislikes. So there was a, a very good paper called the DNA of disruptive innovators. So how do you add disruption to any innovative thinking? And there are aspects of cognitive behavior, which involve associating. And then there's aspects of behavioral aspects or, or behavioral changes that you can implement. So starting with the cognitive aspects, the main one is association. And I would like to say that what you guys are doing, this COSIG initiative, is definitely innovative. So already you're associating and you're collaborating um, in something that's unique. And so you're already starting with innovation right off the hop as you're finishing medical school. Other aspects which involve more behavioral attributes include questioning. The second one is observing. The third one is networking. And the final one is experimenting. So those are things that you will do perhaps with equipment, perhaps with research interests that you have, perhaps with business ventures, perhaps in the delivery of care. So the first one, which is questioning, is always sort of being critical about something, not because something has been done all the time in one way, should it stay like that? So always question and look at different opportunities. Observing is very important. To give you an example, um, it was Charles Kelman back in the late 60s when he was having his teeth cleaned that he basically said, well, if I have this ultrasound on my teeth and it can remove the buildup, why don't we use that to remove cataracts? And that's how fake emulsification started. Uh, uh, there have been many other examples in medicine, and I'm sure you're aware of that as you're almost nearing your, your medical school. So keep observing and keep questioning. The next one is networking. And that's one thing that I think has been lost, unfortunately, during these two years, but the opportunity will come. I'm, as a matter of fact, next month, I'll be attending my first in-person meeting, the COS meeting in Halifax. We're very excited about that. And it is that networking that really triggers innovation. There have been several things that I've done in my practice simply for having sat down with someone to have a coffee or have a drink and chatting, and all of a sudden I'm implementing a new treatment, a new technique, or I'm contacting a company to get a new piece of equipment for my practice. So never miss that opportunity to attend receptions, to integrate with the groups and to really chat about your, um, your aspirations and your goals. And the final aspect about um, innovation is experimenting. So I'll tell you, a few years ago, I implemented in my office a dry eye clinic. I had observed that things uh, were really kind of kicking up in the uh, area of dry eye. And I saw that a lot of patients were uh, having these issues in my community. I started questioning what was the treatments, what were the treatments uh, available at that time. I networked with different companies and then we began experimenting. Now, that specific dry eye clinic evolved into something that has been more successful in a virtual way as opposed to an in-person way, but we experimented. I don't call it a huge success, 
but I think it's an important thing and it was important for us to try it. So never be afraid of, of trying. Like Steve Jobs used to say, stay foolish, stay, stay, stay young. So stay foolish and stay young. So the young mind is one that questions, that experiments. And the foolish mind is one that tries things even if they seem a little bit silly, but maybe they will yield some results. So with this, I would like to thank the COSIC committee uh, for this opportunity to chat with you. If you have any burning questions, please feel free to contact me through the COSIG uh, organizers. I'll be happy to, to address some of your questions or chat. Maybe if you, if you go to the COS in Halifax, we can sort of touch base as well. So remember uh, the aspects of how you got here. Remember all those stages in development that I mentioned. Remember some of those business aspects as well that we discussed and also some of the aspects on innovation. Um, you face a few interesting months ahead. Many of you will get into ophthalmology, maybe of you will not. And that is, that is a fact, simply by numbers. But never lose sight of what should be your ultimate purpose, which should be to really serve in the best way you can the patients that need our care, our expertise, our skills. And you may find in five or 10 years that maybe something that happened along the lines has resulted in something that still makes you grateful for the job you're doing and for the life you've had. So best of luck and um, hope to meet you in person. Thank you.